um, when I asked the Lord a couple of days ago what what he wanted me to speak about, um, he brought up the topic of self-righteousness. So I've been working on that word today, courtesy of the Holy Spirit, because we can do nothing apart from Jesus. Amen. We can do nothing apart from being empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so I'm going to start with Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner." I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So here we have someone that is puffed up in his own mind. We have someone who's prideful, who's arrogant, who's boastful, thinking more highly of himself than he ought to think. But God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We must decrease ourself for God's spirit to increase in us. If we are filled with the spirit, we will be led by the Holy Spirit. But if we are filled up with self trusting in our own abilities our own wisdom forgetting that our righteousness is not our own when we fall in the dangerous trap of comparison where we start to minimize our faults our shortcomings and say things like well at least i'm not like you at least i'm not like them at least i'm not that bad at least I, I never did any hard drugs. At least I didn't sleep around like that girl did. The attitude in itself screams of pride. I'm bad. I messed up. I made some mistakes. I did some things I regret, but I'm not that bad. And then point to others as your example. But let's look at how the Lord feels about this particular attitude and mentality in us. Proverbs six sixteen to 19 tells us there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. The first one listed is haughty eyes. The next one is a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies and a man who stirs up dissension, or other versions of the Bible will say strife, division, discord, contention among brothers. Psalm 1827, for you rescue an afflicted people, but you humble those with haughty eyes. Psalm 101.5 says, I will destroy anyone who secretly slanders his neighbor. I cannot tolerate anyone with haughty eyes, or an arrogant heart. Proverbs 16, 18, we're told pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit right before a fall. So what does the word haughty even mean? In Greek, it means vain, which is connected to vanity, arrogant, elevated, pretentious, high and mighty, uplifted, conceited, the characteristic of one with a swollen estimate of his own powers or merits, disdain and self-exaltation, looks down on others, always treating them with insolence and contempt. God not only hates when we act this way, but we're told he will not tolerate it and that we will be humbled for having such an attitude or carrying ourselves 
in such a way. This is why it's so important to do a heart check daily. You're not checking your heart. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to check your heart when you ask him to. You're going to ask the Lord to check your heart and reveal to you your hidden faults, what's concealed from, from the natural eye, and he will show it to you. So arrogance, high-mindedness, a holier-than-thou attitude, self-righteousness, pride, ego, conceit, haughtiness. The Lord loathes and despises these things in us. We're warned they come before a fall. That means before he pulls us off that pedestal that we've placed ourselves on and we fall with a mighty crash. The higher you are, the harder you fall. In Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, we see what happens before such a fall. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And again in Ezekiel 28.2, the Lord of heaven's armies addresses Satan's pride and desire to be worshipped. Son of man, say to the prince of Tyr, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up. One of the definitions of haughtiness was elevated. And you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. In verse 12, the Lord says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. I want to stop there for a second. So to all those people who have believed what uh, the media shows us when it comes to the devil, how he is some sort of hideous beast. It says here that the devil started off as an anointed cherub who was covered in all kinds of jewels and precious stones. And as a matter of fact, it was the very beauty that God gave him that got to him so that he was puffed up and 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 um elevated in his mind and thought more highly of himself than he ought to and God had to bring him down a notch by explaining to him I am the one who established you you were on the holy mountain of God you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Verse 16 tells us how he became filled with violence within. So he was cast out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up. This is what happens right before a fall. It starts in the heart. The heart gets lifted up. The heart gets a little too full of self. There's not, there's a not enough humility and meekness in there. And the heart becomes puffed up like bread becomes puffed up when it bakes. Beware of the leaven. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, beauty, conceit. Pride, vain, vanity, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. He corrupted the wisdom that God gave him for the sake of his splendor. What is splendor? The definition of splendor is superbness, majesty, glamour, 
brilliance, magnificence, glory, mighty power, and greatness. These are all the things that God gave Lucifer, who was previously an anointed cherub until iniquity was found in him. He got lifted up in his heart and puffed up in his mind. What does violence mean? Violence means disorder, disturbance, vehemence, to use force, to seize, to lay hold of something aggressively. Satan wanted to be worshipped. But how many of us know that God mentions numerous times what happens when we become prideful because the glory is his alone and he gives his glory to no one. As mentioned earlier, Romans 12, 3 says, and I'm using the Amplified Bible for this, for by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has apportioned to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. For just as in one physical body, we have many parts and those parts do not all have the same function or special use. So we who are many are nevertheless just one body in Christ and individually we are parts of one and another, mutually dependent on one another since we have gifts that differ According to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them accordingly. So here we're told everybody in the body has something to contribute individually and as a whole. No one is more important or more significant than the other. Titles don't matter in the kingdom of heaven. This is the upside down kingdom where the least will be the greatest. We run into problems when we start envying another person's walk. And that hinders our ability to celebrate their victories and triumphs with them. We're all running the same race. It's just at different paces. But self-righteousness will have us looking at someone else's walk and then shaming them for not being further along in their walk than we think they should be. But we're not God. If fruit is evident in their life, hallelujah, we didn't change overnight. And we can't expect that from others. Don't ever forget where you were when God called you out. Titus 3 5 is a very humbling passage. It is there to remind us that our righteousness, our righteousness is not our own. God did not save us because of our righteousness. The Lord took pity on us in our wretched and deplorable state. He had mercy on us. His mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So that should clear up any confusion. There is nothing good in us apart from Jesus Christ. Our idea of what is good is severely compromised and doesn't align with the standards of a holy, blameless God who has no sin in him. Our righteousness is God's when we become children of God and we are saved by God's grace through faith that faith was a gift. That faith is then what justifies us and makes us right in God's sight. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the cross. Faith in the work on the cross. The shed blood, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to atone for our sin. Anything good in our character comes from the Lord. As a child of God, we have nothing to brag or boast about. We are justified before God because Jesus, God in the flesh, lived a perfect life. One that every single one of us are not capable of. We are flawed and imperfect. As a Gentile, we were grafted into the tree, not because we got it right. 
sin means to miss the mark. We were grafted in because his chosen special people, the house of Israel, rejected him. Because their Messiah had come and they knew it not. They did not recognize him. Christ is the vine and we are the branches. Apart from him, we can't bear any good or lasting fruit. Any good works we do now are empowered by his grace. I do want to emphasize that we need to have a continuous relationship with him to bear any good or lasting fruit. The Holy Spirit is who equips us, empowers, and enables us to encourage, uplift, teach, edify, convict, rebuke, and touch the hearts of his people. Any creativity, any wisdom, any skills, any knowledge, any understanding we have or are given is not our own either. So we should not be impressed with ourselves. Otherwise, God has a way of quickly humbling us as a reminder that we are ill-equipped to do anything without his counsel, leading, direction, strength, might, power, comfort, influence, protection, etc. When someone teaches a doctrine that's laced with legalism, pride, arrogance, ego, self-righteousness, this is what happens. Romans 10, 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. This is someone who has to have the last word, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. I do need you to understand that someone can have the Holy Spirit and can also have a spirit of religion or legalism that taints what they are teaching. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So what is godliness with contentment? Godliness with contentment is when we realize that there are no amount of works we can do to attain right standing with God. We are not in right standing with God because of anything we do or have done. We are in right standing with God because we placed our faith in Jesus Christ and what he already did for us. I need to emphasize again, you do need to continue a relationship with him. You cannot just say a 10 minute prayer and then go on your merry way. You can do nothing apart from Christ. That's why he said it is finished because the work was already done. The work was already done 2,000 years ago. Mission accomplished. Jesus does not need our help. We need his. We can't go a day without his help. That's why the Bible says, give us today our daily bread. And Jesus is the bread of life. And if you are going to know the Lord, your God, if you're going to get to know his heart and his nature and his character, you have to be in the word, meditating on the word day and night. That is how we get to know the author and finisher of our faith by spending time with him in his word. In his presence. When we start misplacing our faith. And putting it in our own ability to meet. A holy standard. Or the righteous requirements of God. What we're saying in that moment is. We don't need him. We're saying we don't need Jesus. We're saying his blood wasn't enough. To cleanse us of all unrighteousness. To take away the stains of our transgression. We're saying we need something more, but God's grace is sufficient. There is nothing more you need to do 
to find favor in God's sight. Child of God, you are clothed in a robe of righteousness that doesn't even belong to you. It's on loan until you get your own or are raised with him in glory.